Hey, hello everyone. It is time once again for Workshop Wednesday, where we will be painting minis yet again. Um, I have a whole bunch of little human minis, much like last time I'll be working on those, as well as some giants. So we got some giants to work on here, and uh, those will take a little while to the paint. Fortunately, these giants are it's basically skin tone and then uh, loincloth. So um, I can more or less just slather some stuff on and get these guys painted. So it's one of the reasons why I wanted to do them tonight. As usual, actually, let's go ahead and get some music going here. Get some music. Whoa. That is perhaps a bit too strong. Actually, we might do that and then uh, I hope I you find what you Okay, let's try the audio down there or so. See how that does. Let me know how that is audio wise for uh, for everything else. Um, not incredibly thrilled with this song, so I'm gonna skip it. All right, so we're gonna go ahead. Okay, hold on. That is not the kind of music I was looking for. Okay, that's the music I was looking for. So as usual, we've got... For some reason, we gotta have lyrics in all these songs. So I'm gonna definitely... All right, so the plan here is to uh, paint up some of these folks um, and just get some paints on all of them. I think I might start with the, yeah, I'm gonna start with the giants 
because it's just going to need a lot of uh, paint. Now, where is my jar? I need my jar. I guess it's not a jar, it's my little glass bowl there. So, we got our we got the bowl. Um, we can start with the flesh tone. Oh, actually, he's still got some support material on him right there. Let me pull that off. So, these are 3D printed. And one of the things about 3D printing is that you end up with these um, uh, sort of support structures that'll come up, and I've taken off almost all of them. But let's see if we can zoom in here. I have a lot of light right there. Adjust this over. There we go. So there's a bit of support structure right there. It looks kind of like part of his beard. Um, there we are. It's part, part of his beard, but that needs to, to be ripped off. And so I normally use needle nose pliers for that for the large pieces. Then I have these little uh, little gripper things here that work well for other parts. And if you could off a lot of those weirdnesses. Big old lip there. Alrighty, good. So there's our giant, and now we can start painting. So we need a flesh tone. Um, I've been playing around with this and reading up on this, sort of how to get a decent flesh tone. That's not right. Uh, turns out, good flesh tones are simply a medium brown, and then you add in yellow and white and other colors. So I'm just gonna start with a simple brown here and lighten it up a little bit. This is a little uh, darker than I want the giant's skin to be. Um, maybe I'll do a little bit of yellow into there and a little white, white, and we'll see what that looks like. Very low on white. So I'll put that on my shopping list. We'll start with some extra white and I'll throw in a little bit as well, just to see what that gives me. Mix that around. And that gives me a, yeah, nice sort of tanned mid flesh tone for a Caucasian, by like Caucasian standards, but almost, um, yeah, all sorts of different things. Okay, so let's. Go ahead and start there. Um, I mean, this is a big guy, so I'm going to use a relatively big brush and just put it pretty much everywhere. One disadvantage of the clear plastic is that it does not look too great if the uh, if any of it comes through on the miniature. Oops, let me show you what I'm doing here. So you really want to make sure that you cover every square inch and you probably will end up needing um, two coats. So we do that and we give the character a fair amount of color. And of course you can always come back in and Add some more paint later. Nothing preventing that. Should probably. Oh. So you might be able to see here some of the support structure right here on the back. Zoom in. Zoom in. There we go. So you see that support that right there, that sort of knobbly bit. Knobbly bit. Nope. Uh, yeah. 
that knobbly bit there um, should be sanded off. I actually have some little files I'm gonna grab real quick. This is a new thing I'm trying, actually. I've had sandpaper up to now, and for my Gundam model kits, it's often recommended to have um, files, in you know, like the little emery boards, the kind you use to file down your nails for that. Um, as is usual with these things, the packaging is not openable by human hands. You cannot, cannot actually get into the thing. Ah, uh, wait, there's a little tab on the back but it's perforated weird, and so it doesn't actually work. Okay. Well, yep, that ripped a hole in it, but I don't know what that, that, how that helps. Ah. Okay. I'll get these out eventually. Ah. Okay, and, yeah. and what's great is ah, they're emery boards, so they're really rough on your fingers while you're trying to rip this out. And of course they have plastic in there, okay. Ugh. Gosh. Not enough plastic on these things. Uh, and this is going to go right there for now. Okay, so. Obviously this has some stuff on it, which is unfortunate. But I'm going to try using this emery board to uh, sand down that weird protuberance on his back. And obviously I'm going to get a little bit of paint on the... Uh, on that, but that's not the worst thing in the world. This is just a lot easier than trying to do this with sandpaper. The sandpaper is just a much larger surface uh, that you're trying to wrap around there. So yeah, that is actually a pretty effective way of doing that. Okay, so that gets much of it down. Uh, there's still a little bit of a lump there, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. All right, let's continue painting him. Get that arm done. So this is a little, uh, can be a little tedious depending on your personal preferences. But personally, I don't mind this part at all. It's, there's enough to pay attention to you're not going to get completely bored. Right? It's not completely mindless. But uh, it's also not something where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm going crazy with the difficulty or the challenge or the complexity. You're just putting paint on. Again, trying to make sure we get everything. He actually has a little bit of a a little bit of hair on the very top of him. So right there on the top of his head, there's a little... Right there. That would zoom in again. How did you do that? Pop. How did you do that? Pop. You just did it. Well, go down here. And we'll come back up here. That's weird. We did it out a second ago. There we go. Nope. Further up. Further down. Okay. Obviously, I need to play with that more. So let's do the legs. Things don't always work the way you expect them to. Now, the other thing about people is they do not have completely even skin tones. He actually is wearing sandals, which is kind of funny. So I'll go ahead and paint the sandals. I'll give that some, like a, a brown or something. So yeah, so we're gonna have some, uh, um, some color down there. So ideally, you'd come in here and you would paint different parts of the character slightly different skin tones because that's reality. Like, look at my hand. It's a different color there than it is there. 
and also the different colorations all around the hand. So that's one way of making a mini look more realistic, but I'm certainly not that concerned with that personally yet. And as I've been doing with other minis, I'm going to do different skin colors for each giant. That way you can tell them apart. It's so like, you're going to have, as I said before, you're going to have multiple different minis you're painting yourself. You might as well make them all, each unique. Because you don't need to do the same paint job for every single one like you do in the, in the Chinese factory manned by 12 year olds. And there's a little bit of that uh, support material down there. And I'm just not going to bother with it. Okay. So there's that. Cool. This is one thing I really love about this. Which is that when you get this painted up, you get all these bits. Got his chest there. There, there's a little bit more that needs in here. There we are. And this is what I love about this is that once you get all this done, just this much, you're like, dang. Like that's not a bad. That's not a bad mini right there. You know, I could certainly feel that, and sure, there's some round going around different places but that's that's pretty reasonable okay so there's him and that will that will uh, dry to a slightly different shade uh, so now I'm going to take this and uh, change it around a bit to have a different um, skin tone so I'm going to add some more brown to that and mix that in it's also give me a little more paint to work with which is good that's a little, that's significantly darker. Um, just for fun, let's add some more yellow. Um, I've heard folks say that uh, you also get a lot of blue in some people. Interesting. The yellow and the brown probably shouldn't cancel each other out. It gives us a significantly different color than that. So yeah, there's an interesting tone to that. So we're gonna compare that brown to that brown. Interesting, yeah. Um, hmm. Make it a little lighter. It's a little lighter. Maybe a lot lighter. funny because I added the brown, now I'm adding the white. What's going on here? What am I doing? I'm just doing the same color. I just end up with the same color. I wanted to go darker initially. What am I doing? Yeah, it's actually going lighter. Do I want to go lighter? Yeah, I do. Alright, I'm going to go lighter with this one. The more I think about it, the more I want to go lighter. And then we'll do a, a darker skin one for the last one. Again, just using variations on all of these. And I'm going to add a tinge of red uh, to the last one. Darker and a little more red. Actually, I'm going to go more red on this one. That's what I want. I want some red. Let's add some red to him. Lighter tinge, lighter tinted shade. But, ooh, that may be too much. Let's see what red does to that lighter. Uh, ooh, I think we might be killing ourselves here. It is red. This might be too much, but we'll see. I want to... Ooh, that's actually rather nice. Now, is that still reasonably flesh-colored is the question? Hmm. I don't know. Feeling a little purpley. 
Um, I'm gonna add some more. Uh, hmm. Some more yellow, maybe? Let's try some yellow. Just experimenting. See what happens. Is the yellow even it out? Just make it a weirder color. No, the yellow definitely helps. The yellow is definitely making it a little more of a natural color, a little less purpley. A little more of a, a color, of a flesh tone you actually see in person. Okay, good. Yeah, that's... That's the right skin tone. All right, definitely not the first one. Um, and actually, while I'm at it, I might uh, skin tone with these other guys. I should be doing that as well. All right, should have done that with the other color. Um, so we'll just uh, slather that on this guy. Give him a slightly ruddier complexion, hopefully. And. Once you've done one, the, the other nice thing about doing multiple minis like this is that once you've done one, well, the problem is where this camera's going. What I'm going to do, pull the camera out a little bit more. Yeah. Um, one reason I like painting several minis of the same type at once is that you get used to the dimensions of one, and then you can much more quickly move on to other ones of the same shape. You're like, oh yeah, that part need, needs coloring. That doesn't. Boom. Boom! You might be hearing the dulcet tones of the 3D printer in the background. That is, oh, another one of those things in the back. But I'm actually okay with that. And I'm actually 3D printing some uh, name plates a friend of mine who uh, wanted to do or is going to be doing a uh, sort of a Scooby Doo ish game at a local or at a not a local but another uh, tabletop gaming space and uh, so I'm we're printing little name plates for each of the characters I can sit on the on the uh, on the table. Everyone can know who's what. This is a nice skin tone. I really like this. Like I said, it, it feels like a real human's, or a, a real humanoid's, if you will, uh, skin tone. But it's not just like a stock, uh, stock skin color. Feels like somebody who's uh, nothing else been outside a lot, which is cool. Eventually, at some point, it would be cool to get to the point where I'm modifying each giant slightly, I could print them at slightly different sizes, you know, maybe even tweak the uh, the. The arm positions. Now, this is a solid shape in the, 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 the modeling package, right? So it's not like I can go and change a, uh, an arm position and everything will move along with it. Um, it's basically a statue, so you have to um, uh, you know, be careful with what you slice and, and move around. So that's a, a, a restriction, but otherwise, otherwise, we're good to go. Here, up in there. But yeah, these things come off the printer pretty clean. Um, there's obviously some supports underneath. Oops, obviously some supports underneath. Um, but those snap right off, and it's uh, pretty, pretty clean. You, know, you can see there's some stuff around the feet um, that's still on there, and that you, at least I have not been able to remove easily and consistently. That's just kind of reality. All right. So clearly, 
hopefully the, the new camera will be able to figure out this zoom problem a lot better and will focus correctly. That will be coming in a few weeks. Annoying. Okay. I might just give all of my humans down there this skin tone. It's just really nice. Obviously some of them will be different, but one of those things where like this might not be a bad place to start. So all the all my human minis down there in the white at least have a a skin tone. I can always throw another skin tone on top of it. Might do that. Oh, and the toes. Almost got the toes. Can't forget the toes. Okay. So here we go. Focus. 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 Down. Focus. Side. Side. Focus. 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 Uh, he won't. It won't work. Okay. But yeah, there's a good start. And like I said, I think I'm just going to go in here and uh, start slapping some of this color on the faces and kind of the exposed points of a bunch of these miniatures um, just so I've got some skin tone on them. This guy's a real mess. Oh, and he's in Pet G, that's right. This is a different, different uh, type of filament. And uh, it's just, it's very different. Interesting. Tends to be a little more, um, tends to trail off a bit more of, of the stuff. That could just be my settings though. I get a lot of little bits of plastic sort of uh, you know, sticking off of little bends and corners and things in this. It's strange. I don't know why that would happen more than other filaments, but it's it's, it's its own filament. Like that, That's one of the things. Is Every type of filament, and PETG is a kind of plastic, um, but every filament works its own way. Okay, I'm just slathering that on. Um, I don't think there's anywhere else really that's, well, there's a little bit in there that's exposed. Near the armor. Sort of the upper thigh there is exposed. Which is not completely unrealistic. It's really hard to armor that and still give you freedom of movement. So, there. And then we can do a little bit. Same thing around the knee. Give him some flesh around that, and, and again, I'm just kind of slapping that off or around. You can always uh, paint over that with the next color. Um, back as well, right there. And we have to it. So, again, it's a weird paint job, especially because of the red color of the mini. Um, but at least you get the paint on it. Okay. Um, and then we've got this little, little cute character, actually. It's just a, a character with a backpack. That's zoomed in, right? And a, a ponytail. Not a ponytail, but with a bob. I like that. And for this, I'm going to go with a different brush. Um, I need something very, very thin and small for this. So, then dip in a little bit of paint. Do the face. This is 
nice. You're gonna get the paint. You gotta get the face painted, the neck. And you come back in and add all the other details. But at least now you have a skin color. Um, and I think the character is pretty much, yeah, the character is covered with clothes everywhere else. So, that's good. Um, yep, sweet. Uh, same thing with this guy. I think I'll give him a face. Try not to splatter it too, too heavily. Give him a neck as well, pretty nice. Um, and otherwise, I think he's completely clothed. Yep. Okay. Um, got this big old dude. Oh, yeah. Forgot about this big old dude. Yeah, this is definitely going to be his skin color. Uh, this is a big old barbarian who has a big old axe. And uh, he's shirtless, as all good barbarians should be. And so we're going to give him his... Uh, his flesh. Ooh, I'm definitely need some work. In the back here. Let's see how much we can shave down of that. Very awkward uh, position here. I'm hoping. Shave down a significant percentage of the support material. So we can look a little more. And I can actually tear it off. Ah. Come on. There's a bit that's sticking off there. There we go. Sometimes you can just tear it off, and that's obviously how I start. But you gotta be careful there. Because if you're too rambunctious, you're going to end up ripping, ripping off important parts. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to, you know, start ripping off a, some support structure and end up ripping off a, the whole arm. Which I've done before. But on the other hand, you know, you can't sandpaper down massive amounts of plastic. So you got to kind of figure out your... Figure out what you can or can't do. And it doesn't help when you have weird things like this guy's uh, this guy's axe. This guy's axe. Oops. Come on, dude. This is covering, you know, literally three quarters of it, but you're 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 zooming behind it. That's ridiculous. Okay. So you see how the axe here is right next to the, the arm. And the arm has stuff that needs to be pull, uh, scoured off it. So it's really hard to get in there around the axe. But this definitely helps. Okay. Can't get every single angle, which is annoying. But you can definitely make it better than it was. Which is pretty much the point. And while I'm at it, I'm going to try to do the same thing with the axe handle. Because there's some support material on there, and again, it's really delicate. Where I don't want to get in there and try to rip things out, because then I'm, I'm going to rip that axe right off of his of the uh, the miniature. But hopefully, I can separate out the larger hunks and make it look pretty close to normal. Yeah. Oh, good. That came off. There's a little next to the head. Yeah, it's already bending. The uh, the axe handle. Okay. Can I pull that little bit of plastic off? Yes. Okay. So I'll try to sand off some lines there. 
And you can see very clearly here that uh, the lines here, those are the lines from the support structures. So that I want to sand off because you're not going to have an axe with big old, big old lines like that on it, right? Hey, Kuma! So we're starting out with some big old giants and moving on to some of these smaller guys. I'm going to go back to painting my third giant. But before I do that, since I have some nice flesh-colored stuff, um, uh, all, all mixed up here, I figured I'd go ahead and, and put some flesh on the, uh, my, my minis, the other minis. Give them all a, uh, a starter. Okay. So this emery board is not doing a great job on this very delicate axe here. Delicate, obviously, being relative, relative. But... Let's live with that. Okay. So, yeah, let's give him the rest of his paint, paint job. Big shirtless barbarian. Um, there is a lot of lore behind this. So, basically... My players have just been contacted by a ship captain. He was very nervous and very, he, like, he wants to get moving right away on his little quest because he knows somebody's after the same treasure he's going for. And that's always something that you, you know, that gets people, gets people pumped. Gets people, like, oh, we gotta get, get moving here. And, uh... He has an airship, which is really cool. And that airship is going to go not just into the sky, it's going to go beyond their world. It's a whole nother, essentially a space encounter, because D&D has space encounters, which is really cool. And unfortunately, it turns out the ship captain is more than he seems. He is actually secretly a beholder. I think I've mentioned beholders in the past. I certainly mentioned them last week. They are really crazy multiple eye creatures. And um, he's after this artifact created by other beholders. Which is always a little scary. When you've got an, an insane creature going after an artifact. And so the, the player characters will, you know, one way or the other, find themselves at this essentially giant asteroid floating in space that actually houses this killer um, thing, this, this killer artifact. And the Beholder, if they find out about him ahead of time, um, then he just goes crazy and, and transforms and goes inside. Um, if not, when they get there, then he just goes crazy and transforms and, and, and leaves them. So basically, you know, one way or the other, even if they attack him, he just flies off and ends up entering this asteroid. And inside the asteroid is a number of different environments. The asteroid itself is actually this sort of uh, closed loop feedback system to generate magical power by creating uh, miniature environments that embody certain features, certain concepts. And, oh, there's a bit more to pull out there. And so each environment embodies a certain thing, one embodies dreams. One embodies um, living close to nature, etc. And by having all these environments in it, it, it essentially is generating all this magical power, uh, which then powers this this giant artifact inside the Ravager. I think he's gonna be barefooted because he's a barbarian. Um, not the barbarians can't. Oh, that's really good. Now that I have the Emery board, I'm gonna use it for everything. Um. Nope, can't. A little bit. Yeah. 
can't get in there. Can't get in there. So inside those environments are a bunch of different creatures, depending on the thing. Now, the environment of dreams is just a giant mist. And when the players go into there and start investigating, they're pulled into the mist and they have to answer these questions and basically uh, resolve this, this, they're attacked in their dreams um, by the, the keeper of that room. And uh, they have to uh, deal with that. But then there's this one environment which is um, all about sort of the bucolic land and uh, farming. And it's got a bunch of giants in it. And these giants um, have a bunch of goats that they farm. Sounds a little strange, but it's true. Um, and they've been living here for generations, just doing their thing. They don't even realize that they're part of a giant artifact. They've just been transplanted here, and this is the thing they do. So, um, we've got all these different environments and all these different minis for those environments. Um, oops, all right. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and put, like I mentioned earlier, I'm just going to use this flesh tone, not because I want everyone to have exactly this flesh tone, but because if I just give them all at least this flesh tone, then I can always go back and, and tweak it. But then if I, if I forget, then at least you know, everyone's got a flesh tone. Um, all right. Cool. He's got a face, and she's going to get a face. So that's the hill giants kind of raison d'etre, their reason for being there. Right, so there's the girl. Um, I cannot tell. I'm going to give her uh, hands, not gloves, or have her, her hands be hands, not gloves. Can't really tell that this level of detail, whether those are gloved or not, so I'm just going to make them flesh colored. Um, and I think everything else on her is covered. Yep. Um, ditto this, no, he's, he needs to be darker skin. I just, you know, you, sometimes you see a person and you're like, nope. And this guy is just totally covered with uh, armor and craziness. Um, this guy will also have the skin. Um, the, the, the mist is really more of a, um, a manifestation of the keeper of that place. Each environment has its own sort of guardian that makes it work, that, that ensures that everything functions kind of as it's anticipated. Um, and the mist is actually, literally, one of the forms that that guardian takes. Um, it, it expands out into this giant mist that fills out the room, and that's kind of the, its natural state when people go in there. And then that's what it uses um, to envelop people who are coming in and uh, and subject them to this this dream state test. Um, one of the cool things about D and D, you get these weird fantastical concepts where it's like, no, the mist is actually a creature. Like it, it is actually the thing in here that is guarding it. It's keeping everything the way it is. Really? Yep. It can do that. So I'll just get these arms painted up with this flesh tone. More or less flesh tone. Some kind of flesh tone. And then we'll do a darker color. And we'll do a darker skin for both the giant and that dude. And then, like I said, we're gonna have a little here at the joint of the armor and the the crotchal region. And he could be wearing like leggings or something there, but for now. And then same thing down here. It makes sense when you're wearing leggings the more I think about it, but that's okay. I'll always come back over here with another color if I want. And then back there. So yeah, there's one that is just sort of the primal nature of disassembly, of of taking things apart. So inside it is this giant torso, 
So there's just the, again, that sort of flesh color scheme on him as a starter point. Let me show you that real quick. It's in the other room. Missing a large piece. One second. If your average mini, if your humanoid mini is this big, this guy is this big. That's what they face. This, uh, this creature that inhabits this room and just likes to tear things apart. And what he tries to do to the main characters. So yeah, imagine that bearing down at you. Not fun. Um, but fun for me, the DM, to see how the players will react and deal with it. Um, d and is absolutely accessible to any, everyone. There is a bit of an acquired taste in the sense that it's very hard to explain to other people what D&D is like in a way that anyone can understand. Like You really have to play D&D to understand the way it works. Um, and until you've done that, it just, um, it's really hard to, to, to excite people about it. Um, you can do things like watch Critical Role or Dice Camera Action or any of the other YouTube things where people uh, play the game. Um, you can certainly do that, but, and that can get people interested. Um... But once people, you know, play for an hour or two, you know, they're generally they're hooked or they're not. Like they get it or they don't. All right. So there's that. All right. Good. So I have skin tones on all those guys. We'll move on to darkening up that. And I've got a darker brown. Um, so yeah, I think it's pretty accessible. Uh, I mean, part of the problem is just you gotta, you know, have friends. Um, I mean, you can play online with with random people, um, but it, it requires, you know, multiple people and time and sitting down. The average session, about three hours, plus or minus. Um, back in the day, it was four plus. Um, these days, it's closer to three uh, for most people. It's just hard to get people together for very long. It makes that even darker. So usually when I run games there, like I said, three hours, give or take. You can totally play for an hour, and that's fine. Um, but having everyone, giving everyone time to do their thing in an hour is a little hard. There's just, you know, it, it's hard for everyone to have, have time to do things in an hour. All righty. So we've got this guy over here. He's kind of dry, but I think he'll be okay. All right, so here's our other, other guy. Yeah, I like this. This sort of nut brown here. That's, that's a good, good color. Interesting skin tone. And the cool thing about this particular encounter is that these giants are pass uh, are, are peaceful. I'm gonna say pacifist. That's not exactly right. Um, but they're just shepherds. Um, so if you antagonize them, they'll be more than happy to smash their your skull in. But they're not aggressive. 
So, and in, in their environment, um, I can't remember exactly how all that works. It's been a while since I read that part of the adventure. Um, but basically, um, there is a hidden guardian in there. Um, so they're not aware of this, this guy. And uh, that kind of has an effect on things, things there. So if you play your cards right, the giants can actually assist you. But if not, then they can uh, be your enemies. But they're, they're kind of orthogonal to the main bad guy. Right? They're not particularly... Um, they don't have to be enemies or allies in the adventure. There's a, there's a different villain to deal with. And yeah, one of these days, Kuma, we'll have to, uh, I'll have to run a D&D game for you. We'll get that going online. A little bit of the support structure going to get off there. Or at least sand down. better. Ooh. I don't want to say he has some lumps on his back. That's fine. But yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely interesting. And different enemies work different ways. Right? Some of them are just, they just come up and whack at you with their fists. Others have delicate spells. Um, others are very tricky. There's one area that is about creation, and the inhabitants are all these mud people. Uh, they're humanoids made of mud. Uh, they're just gonna go around doing things. Um, and the guardian of that, of that area has grown completely insane and likes to torture them. So, just random, insane things happen out of nowhere. Um, the ground explodes. Houses grow legs and walk around. Um, so he just he he loves terrorizing these poor mud creatures, and always can always just make more. Um, doesn't usually kill them, um, but that that's an interesting environment for a group of players characters to come in. Um, because there's there are these sort of innocents, they are being hurt, um, but there's no clear um, uh, structure, if you will. It's just bad things are happening, right? And they've got to figure out what to do, how to find, you know, whatever this thing is, stop it, etc. Um, hopefully, you know, they may have to kill it. Um, they may find other ways of dealing with it, or they could just move on and say, well, it sucks, but um, we have bigger fish to fry. That is also a valid solution, although not always great for the people involved. But sometimes when you're adventuring, you got to pick your battles. But again, it's kind of nice. It's not, uh, you know... The goblins kidnapped the blacksmith's daughter, which is a great way to start a, a, a game. Don't get me wrong. You know, those those clear stories provide a good grounding for for uh, a group of players. Cool, Kuma. Everyone started at some point. Um, everyone always had a first time. Slather this on here, and then once I get the this uh, paint on him and him, then I want to use this skin color on him. I'll go back and do the loincloths on the other uh, giants because they should be drying up now. They should be handleable. 
And I think kind of like this, I'm going to go with some uh, some different brown colors for that. Um, start with just kind of a basic brown and go from there. So it's one of the neat things about D&D, &D, is it, it is just, it is whatever you want it to be. You know, you're a player character. So, for example, let's say Benny and Kuma, you are villagers in a more or less medieval village. You know, you grew up on a farm. Um, you know, your parents had a couple of kids. Um, you help out on the farm. You help out on the farm here and there. You're, you know, you you you're teenagers now. You're starting to think about the way of the world. Um, but you've lived in this village pretty much all your life. And uh, you always heard about these they're nasty creatures out there. Out in the woods. Out beyond the safety of the village. And the village is small. It's basically just all the nearby houses. Um, and a, a, little, a little shrine to the god of the harvest. But it's, it's not a town. You know, it's not like you have a lot of things going on there. Um, there's a, a, a small, small tavern and alehouse where people congregate. But that's really the only public building. And one day, you're, uh, maybe it's market day. You're on the way back from the market. You and your family are in the alehouse. And the door opens, and you see the haggard face of a blacksmith, the village blacksmith. And he opens the door and looks in, and he says, they've done it. They've taken Diana. And you know, Diana is the name of his, uh, his daughter, his teenage daughter. And he said, uh, I was walking back from town not far from the village and uh, goblins came out of the, the woods five of them and we ran and they they grabbed Diana and ran away what would you do? how would you react to that? would you ask the blacksmith for more information? or would you run off There, a little more on the inside. Get that down in there. Get up the inside of the thigh. Okay, I think a little bit more little spots here I can flesh this out. Okay, what information do you want? What, what, what would you ask? Give me a question. Oops, a little bit more over here. I've got to fill in under the arm. That is very true. All right, so there's our. Bobby. That is true. You're a villager. Now you've heard of things in the outside world, right? It's not like you've never heard of anything outside the village, but you've never, certainly never really um, gone outside the village besides, say, down to the stream as a kid, playing in the stream, maybe playing in the woods, very close to the village as a kid. But that would be about the extent of it. So you've heard of orcs and goblins and trolls and fairies and all those things. But you've certainly never done that. Certainly don't know what you're dealing with. Um, okay, we'll give him. Looks like he has. He's not wearing gloves either. So we will throw some paint on his fingers. And this is just slathering paint on.
Okay, yeah, and he says they were... He was coming back from the... First, he gives you kind of this weird look because he's like, don't you trust me? We've, you, know, you grew up here. We, we've been known each other for years. And he says, yeah, we were heading back from the market. And... Uh, suddenly, goblins leapt out from the woods on either side of the, of the road. And, by the way, back in medieval England, a road was usually more or less a, a, a little dirt track, right? There were very few in the, uh, there, there were very little, very few like cobblestone or gravel roads. They were basically, you know, one or two foot wide dirt paths um, um, in most places because most villages and towns didn't have the infrastructure to build big roads. Um, so the, the, the woods are very close on the sides of these roads. And he said, yeah, they just leapt out and grabbed Diana and, and ran off. Um, and uh, uh, actually, he says, uh, um, uh, they, they came after both of us, and one of them knocked me on the head, and I fell down. That's why I didn't rescue, rescue Diana. Um, but I was stunned for a moment. They left me for dead. And when I woke up, they were gone. And so I came back here. Will any of you help me? Will any of you get Diana back? Right. So that's there. Then, like I said, we can now go on and do the... What are we doing there? Yeah, that's... That's dry. Cool. So let's do our... Here's our dark brown. I'm just going to do dark brown, I think. Um, for his... Yeah, you know what I'll do? I'm going to mix dark brown in for this color. And that'll be the color of his clothes. You can go a little darker than that. Yeah. Okay. Is that a reasonable leather color? It doesn't feel like it. It's a nice color, but it doesn't feel like what I want leather to be. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just pull out some dark brown. How about you, Benny? What, what would you do? Knowing that information, I'm just gonna pull out some brown, and um, I'll go ahead and just use that same brush. Get that color off of it mostly. And paint that on his uh, his covering here. Actually, ending up looking much lighter than I thought, partly because of the uh, that clear plastic it goes on. You get, you get kind of that light coat. Uh, that first coat. Okay, we can get that, that down in there. Right, then we get that around here. And this is just slathering paint on. Um, this will look even better when you go back around and add some extra uh, paint, just like daubing in some a lighter or a darker brown around the edges kind of stuff. That can really make something like this pop, if you will. Okay, get around the, the edge of that this uh, loincloth thing here. Oops. A diaper, weirdly enough. Whoop. Uh, well, I accidentally got a little bit on his leg, but I managed to rub it, most of it off. So, whoopsie. 
but I think I'm, I'm, that's okay. Some more here around the band. Okay. Get more the edges here. Easy to forget these uh, the sides and such. Better. Also, I want to make sure I get the back side of the front, the front side of the back. Right, like you have this part here, right, the uh, the part of the loincloth, um, and it has both the front and the back. You got to make sure you get both that side and the other side, and vice versa. Um, So Daniel, t um, Diane, oh you know Diane, Diane's about 16, she is uh, brown hair, brown eyed, a little overweight, um, dark brown complexion, she spends a lot of time with her father uh, uh, learning the, the, the blacksmith trade, she'll probably take over, she's his only child. Um, and so he's, he's figuring she'll probably end up taking over for him. Um, but yeah, you know what, what she looks like. Um, he said goblins. Goblins are small creatures. Small nasty creatures. Green skin. That's all he knows. That's, that's, what, that's what a goblin is. You know, he, he doesn't, he, he doesn't work with goblins either. He doesn't have any... Uh, particular experience with with him. He, he just saw these small green creatures leap out, and as far as he's concerned, those are goblins. And he is not a monsterologist. He saw. Um, he, he said he saw at least four. But they knocked him on the head pretty quick. So there may have been more coming out. But those were all the ones that he saw when he was being attacked. When they were being attacked. They didn't say anything. They, I mean, they, they were shouting things. But it was not in a language that he could understand. It was you know, the equivalent of booga booga booga. So what do you do? So there's oh I mean, we need to we'll give him sandals of the same color. Why not? Not quite done there. And as I usually say when I'm doing this, because this printed with a base, then I often end up getting paint on the base, and I'm fine with that. Um, so Diane was taken um, about a mile away from the village. And he ran here. So far enough away that no one could hear. And I mean, there are outlaws and bandits and such around from time to time. So it's not that unusual um, for unpleasant things to happen on the road. It's just unusual for it to happen to you know, somebody as swarthy as a blacksmith with his daughter. Um, and if it were bandits, they would hold you for ransom. They wouldn't just capture you or, you know, they would, they would 
Uh, they want money. They, they don't want to kill. Necessarily. They can get away with it. But. Yeah. A little farther away. And he'll. And he can. I mean, he'll take you to where they, they, they did it. It's uh, about a mile east of the village on the main road. So what do you do? Okay, so get around, get his sandals. Alright. So there's our giant. Focus. Focus. Nope, not gonna focus. Maybe. Maybe? No. Alright. Get the idea though. So, and again, no point in doing the same color every single time. Just add some. Um, so you're already in the tavern. That 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 is where the blacksmith entered. Um, you know, this is the first, the, the blacksmith just entered the village and just came to the tavern to get help. So what do you, what do you, uh, what do you, what do you, uh, I mean, you can certainly ask people in the tavern, but uh, what are you trying to do? What's the, the goal there? Uh, I always put in too much black. That is now a Instead of darker brown, that is now black. Okay, that's not gonna work. Thank you, yeah, he's definitely coming together. So, um, yeah, yeah, I guess I can just grab some more brown. So what I'll do is grab some brown, put it over here, and then grab some of that black, and just kind of scrape it in. So you get, you know, not, Every bit. There we go. That's what you're going for. Just gonna stay in the tavern all night, all day and all night. Is that the plan? I mean, the goblins are probably not going to do nice things to Diane. If you don't want to help her, that's, you know. That's on you. That, that is certainly a, a viable action if, if you feel this is not something you're, you know, um, that you can do anything about. Gather yeah, food supplies, water and equipment, enable you to travel. I'm gonna to have to trek a long while. Well, it's only a mile. Um, so, I mean, so you can certainly do that, but you know, a mile, that's the, that'll take you, what, um, half an hour to walk? Um, so it, it's not a bad idea to, to, to get stuff. There are no maps. Uh, in the medieval world, people do not, people do not have maps. Um, you know there is another town it's about five miles east of here. It's about ten miles east of here. Maybe about ten miles east of here. Called Green Crag. Um, and there are a few other you know, towns near uh, 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 here and there. So if you want to know if there's something near you, you know, I'll definitely tell you what you know from what people have told you. But you know, people just don't people don't have or carry maps. There's no need. You know, no one ever travels that far. And those that do pay through the nose for maps. So, um, yep, you'll be the first, uh, you, you, you be the first cartographer in this area. Cool. Um, that is what a lot of D&D &D, uh, uh, groups end up becoming, by the way. They end up um, charting out a lot of the region around their area. Um, all right, so you head to um out to to there so let me ask you this question 
when you were growing up, you know, your character in the village, did you want to be strong? Did you want to be skilled? Or were you always envious of those stories of people who cast magic? Strong, skilled, or magic? So by skill, I mean stories about, um, you know, Three Musketeer kind of stories where you're not necessarily Conan the Barbarian, but you're good at uh, jumping around and getting stuff done. All right. So you gather together all of your money, which equates to about, we'll say, three silver pieces, you know, which would be... Um, Eh, these days, you know, a couple bucks. Um, and you go home. Your family's not there. You're out working the field. So you sort of sneak in and you grab your father's sword which he has there. Everybody is required by law to have some kind of weapon, um, you know, for defense of the land or in case, uh, you know, monsters attack. Kind of like out in the Wild West, everyone would have, everyone would own a gun, even if you didn't use it all the time for hunting and such. So you grab the sword and you head out to the last known location. So yeah, so growing up, did you want to be strong? Did you want to be skillful? Or did you want to, always want to have a, you always envy those stories of the people who could cast magical spells. Strong. All right. Cool. So we're going to do something fun here. Uh, Kumu, do you have any six-sided dice handy? Just normal old six-sided dice. If not, can you find some? And obviously this is far from the ideal scenario because of the delay in the chat. So and again, right here, I'm just getting into uh, getting getting the back of that. There we go. Okay. And then let me just get some of these edges here on his his stuff. It looks a little bit more realistic. Randomizer is fine. Uh, go ahead and roll th uh, four six-sided dice, ignore the lowest number, and add the other three together. So roll four dice, ignore the lowest, and add the other three together. And tell me what that number is. Apparently, based on the sound, my print is done. Yay. Let's get up these edges here. Okay. A little bit more back here. Okay. So there's our kind of ruddy giant with his much darker leather clothing better and then for the brown uh, more brown skinned guy I'm gonna go with a lighter tan color for that and I'm just gonna mix in some white to that uh, white <laughs> I 
an interesting color, but it's more gray. Hmm. So we're going to add some yellow to it. Need more white. Got a 13. Very good. So you have a strength of 13, which is pretty good. Uh, the average person has a strength of 10. So you're definitely stronger than the average person. Do you lift, bro? All right. Um, do that one more time. And that will be your wisdom. Same procedure. Um, okay, that's a more of a yellow-gray. Hmm. Let's try some brown on that. Again, I'm going for kind of a tan. But I might not get it. Sort of an olive color? It's not bad at all, really. I don't like that. It's a weird greenish brown. Um, it could be somebody's clothes. But no, not for, for Janet's. I'm gonna go more brown. Twelve. All right. Cool. So you have a wisdom of twelve, which is again. Higher than average. All right. Now what I'm, gonna have you, what I'm gonna have you do, you go out to the last known location of Diana, and you start looking around for clues. With your wisdom of 12, um, you'll get a bonus of one to your to, to your rolls. I want you to roll a 20-sided die, a d20, and add one to it, because your wisdom is 12. There's a there's a formula for it, but it doesn't matter right now. All right. Okay, so I, I like that this tan color. We're going to use that for his uh, his his clothing. That's rather nice. It's, it's a nice uh, contrast. That color. Definitely not the color I I would have chosen, but I'm happy it's the color I ended up with. What you're doing right now is you're gonna make is you're making a perception check, which uses your wisdom, your wisdom modifier. Twenty sided die plus one for your wisdom, and it's gonna tell us what you see as you look around and investigate and look for clues. If you're all high. Then you do well. You roll low, not so well. Not a big problem, but it just means things are not going your way. The 20 sided die is a really interesting way of doing it, actually. And there's all sorts of math and philosophy around why that number is, why they use a 20 sided die. It's a whole big thing in D&D. &D. Right. And the rest of this loincloth painted up. It'll be there. Right. Yeah, nice earth tones for this, this, this giant. Makes sense. Yep, throw a d20. And whatever result you get, add one to it, because you're a little smarter than the average person. A little wiser than the average person. Not necessarily smarter, but you've got, you know, you, you've got some good common sense to you. You've got a, a good, um, you, know, you know how to look at the lay of the land, and you, you spent some time maybe out in the wilderness paying attention to, uh, uh, to the signs of... What is that? A little bit of fuzz in there. Um, you know, animal tracking. You, you've done some, maybe some hunting in your youth. All right? Take your time. Almost done with him.
Benny, if you're still there, feel free to uh, throw in. Okay. There you are. All these little bits that you didn't realize you didn't get. Little spots. I guess the online die roller didn't have a 20 sided die on it. It's frustrating when those things are kind of limited in that way. It's like I know not everything uses every kind of die, but it's, it's nice to support more than just sixes. Six sided. Right, I'm going to go up the back of that loin cloth just to get in there and get that color. And that can be very, very messy because the chances of anyone actually being able to see from that angle are very, very low. But it's just nice to finish it off. And again, if the, if the mini falls over, hey, Yakushiki. Welcome, welcome. Okay. Oh, rolled low. Okay. So you rolled a total of six on your wisdom check. See, here's what happens. You look around. You're, you're in this, this area. So you, you, you walk down the path, the, the road, for a while. And um, it's mid-afternoon at this point. Listening for, for sounds, listening for anything strange. And you get to where the blacksmith said that his daughter disappeared. And you look around, and sure enough, there are signs of a struggle. You see some gouges in the dirt and things along those lines. And you start looking in to the, the woods, and um, you see some branches that are broken. I think they were recently broken. But as you do that, you hear a branch break off to your left side. And you turn to look, and through the trees and through the underbrush, it's thick forests in here, you see movement. And you see this about three foot tall humanoid crouched there, and it's pulling back a bow. There's this this tiny little bow. It's very hard to see. All, all you can see, I mean, you're looking through bushes and all these things, and you're so you see just this small humanoid shape, and you see just what you recognize as a bow because you've grown up in a village. You've seen lots of people pulling bows. What do you do? Oh, I forgot to do his uh, his his feet. I forgot to do his feet too. That's dumb. Um, I've got to do the. Uh, actually, you know what I can do? Just for fun, I'm going to give them different colored sandals because I can. Because why not? So his sandals are black. Maybe like cowhide. Black cowhide? Who knows? Do you see this goblin? This, uh, well, maybe a goblin. Certainly goblin like. It's about 30 feet away. Now, you could certainly. A couple of options. You could try to run at it. Um. You probably wouldn't, you know, be able to reach it before it was able to loose this arrow. But that might also startle it. You could try to, you know, raise a ruckus. Dodge the arrow and assess what's going on and worry about the blacksmith getting attacked. Okay. Oh, the blacksmith's with you. We, we, we forgot to specify this. Yeah, the blacksmith is here. Um, all right. So, the arrow comes flying out at you. Grab a d20 here. So, while I'm doing this, 
do me a favor and roll those four six-sided dice again, dropping the lowest. That's going to be your dexterity, which governs how quickly you can dodge out of the way and otherwise avoid damage. There's my, there's my 20-sider. Okay. So he's so the, the goblin's going to roll for his attack. He rolls a total of five, which is quite low. He's got five there. He doesn't want to show you the five. There's the five. Yeah, it's very dark. Okay. Um, but we'll see how your dexterity compares. Let's do this. Oops. Using the wrong brush. There we go. Probably should use the other brush because this one's giant. And then again, I'm painting a giant, so that's not totally crazy. Yeah, Hyakushiki, we're uh, doing a very simple version of Dungeons & Dragons. Kuma here is uh, a villager who, for whom the, uh, the, the local blacksmith just ran in and said that the, uh, his daughter has been kidnapped by goblins in a road near town. I'm going to do his, so I'm going to mix the black and that color get something different. Yeah. Alright, just sort of a gray. That's fine. That one's different. Yeah. Got a little on his on his feet. Seventeen, nice. All right, so you've got a a. Uh, it, it's very hard to hit you. Excellent. So you see the arrow, the, the bow get pulled back, and an arrow flings at you, but it it misses you by about two feet. Just whoosh, off to one side, and the. Uh, the goblin, or the, the, the creature that you see, you presume it's a goblin, um, then ducks down and, uh, uh, you know, disappears in the foliage in the sense that you know, it seems to move in such a way that it gets, gets behind some kind of foliage or trees that you can't immediately see it. You might have a hidey hole back there or something. There might be a little, uh, um, you know, a little ditch he's dug or there may be a, 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 a stump that he's hiding behind. So what do you do? You can hear very easily th and that unless the goblin has some kind of magical ability, um, you know, it hasn't run completely away, right? You'd, you, you'd hear it crashing through the underbrush if it did that. So it's not like it's completely gone, but it's just managed to uh, duck out of the way, out of, out of your immediate sight. So what do you do? The blacksmith is there. He saw all this happening, and he's just kind of gobsmacked. Whoops. He doesn't really have a, a specific reaction to that. You're rolling very well on your stats, by the way. So how do you want to deal with this goblin? This uh, nasty little, little creature. certainly was not very nice to you. Attacking you without provocation like that. Right there. Do a little bit more. Yeah, I missed a spot up here. Um, I forget what color. Oh, I've totally messed up the color I was using. So I'm just gonna go in here 
and grab yeah I'm just gonna use this gray and just get in some of these spots it won't be exactly the same color but it'll be close enough to darken that up cool get pick up some stones without them as a distraction indicate the blacksmith take cover somewhere or draw the goblins away with a distraction as you do that I'll draw near the goblins okay excellent so you you grab some some stuff uh, and you throw that Excellent. Um, so go ahead and make a dexterity check. Uh, you, you're, you've 17 dexterity, so that's 12, 14. Wow. Um, so you have plus three in your dexterity. So go ahead and roll another 20-sided die and add three to that. That's your dexterity bonus. And uh, we'll see how successful you are at throwing rocks in such a way that you draw the goblin's attention away. And uh, as you're also trying to draw near the goblins, you know, you're, you're, you're tossing things and trying to, you know, uh, uh, hit tree trunks and things like that, not, not waste them. Um, maybe throw them through some, some leaves and such. And you're dodging, dodging around, so you gotta see how well that is able to distract and confuse the goblins. All right, so that's there. Um, what next? So now we need to move on to the other guys. So I'm gonna go ahead and use this. This, uh, no, 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 not for the, not for him. That's silly. Um, I'm gonna use that color for, um, Little Miss Traveler here, I think. I'm gonna start using these colors on my other minis. And what I'm gonna do here, actually, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm gonna just cover this mini with a base coat of this dark color and later I'll come back and give it you know and add detail and add other colors to it but that will just kind of give it a start it's not too bad to have a character that's monocolor um, and especially when you have all these all these minis there's so much to paint that I often get a little overloaded so I'm like, eh. Um, I would like to at least have a a mini that has an interesting color on it. I and mean, I can always add to that. Because very few people are colored a pure white all over their bodies. Okay. Actually, I'm not going to paint up the backpack because I know I want that to be a, a brown. But I will paint the rest of this. And the feet. The boots would probably be brown as well, but that's alright. But the boots might be black. That'd be nice. I don't know. Not sure what the color scheme should be on this person. It doesn't feel like it should be too too dark everywhere. Got a seven. Alright, seven plus three is ten. So that's not bad by any stretch. It's an average result. So what happens is you throw stones in and you do manage to create a, a distraction um, where you head up to the goblin and you come around the side um, and he's looking, there, there's one goblin there around this tree trunk. Uh, and he's looking off to the left, and he looks over to you in shock as you come around this tree trunk to see him, and you just kind of both stop for a second and look at each other. Uh, the blacksmith, meanwhile, has gone. He's taken cover off to the side of the road for the meanwhile. He's still, if you glance over, you see he's still kind of looking at you to make sure you're okay. Um, but he is absolutely following your orders at this point. So you and the goblin are staring at each other. The goblin has... Um, uh, is holding his bow with one hand, but one of his, his hands has gone down to a dagger that's at his belt. What do you want to do? You can intimidate him, you can attack him, you can try to wrestle him to the ground, try talking to him, anything you can think of. But you manage to kind of surprise each other, if you will. 
Um, and kind of the, the, the logic behind that is that the roll wasn't good enough to give you surprise on him, but it was good enough that um, he's not going to you know, uh, he's not going to be surprised by you. It's sort of an equal situation. So what do you do? I also definitely want to give this character a nice hair color. Okay, do 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 in there, there. All right. Um, I feel like this character should have a like a light brown hair color. Ooh, 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 ooh. Is that a usable brush? Not really. Come on. I'm gonna have to clean these brushes here, but I think I can do that. Yeah! That is that character's hair color. I love it when a plan comes together. Yeah. But I'm definitely... Okay, no. While you think about what to do with the goblin, I'm going to clean these brushes. I'll be back in about 60 seconds. Just rinse him off. Throw some dirt in his eyes and point the sword I'm wielding. Okay. Uh, roll a d20 and add three. Another dexterity check to do all that quickly enough for him to not react. Point at his throat. Excellent. Yeah, d20 plus three. Nineteen! Wow! Wow! So you, you, yeah, this dirt goes right in his eyes, and he, ah, uh, a little bit goes in his mouth, actually, too, so, and you point the sword right at its throat. And its eyes get um, get as big as possible with the dirt in it, and it 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 uh, takes its hands up. It drops the bow and puts its hands up. What do you do? You see before you is a small, again about a three foot tall, green skinned humanoid wearing a pair of brown breeches and a thin leather um, shirt. It, it, it looks like it's come, sort of a combination of like a, a rough breastplate, but very, very simply made. Um, and it has this dagger on, it, um, on its side. Sorry, just noticed something here. Um, so yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, so, you know. Now he's still, the, the dagger is still, you know, strapped to his side. Okay, I mean, you can certainly talk to him and, and see if 
if he understands your language. You use simple words, things along those lines. Um, so if you want to try that, uh, go ahead and make another wisdom roll. So. Okay, yeah. So, sword trained at him. You shout at the blacksmith. The blacksmith trudges over um, through the woods and uh, comes over. And he's his eyes are really big as he sees this goblin sort of sitting there just you know, like this. Uh, and the blacksmith does uh, come over and he, he comes over and looks and says, uh, Well done. What do we do now? hair in there. There we go. Alright, so here's a character with hair. A little better. Ah, very good. Very smart. So let me do a quick roll for the blacksmith. Yeah, not great. Uh, so he goes around and he uh, crouches down and goes, and, and you, you see the goblin is getting a little freaked out about you know, what's going to happen to him. He's, he's a little afraid that the blacksmith is going to like grab him and you're going to just stab him through the throat. Um, so the goblin... Okay. Um, uh, uh, stands there, but you, you can see he's, he's getting a little more tense and a little bit more worried about what's going on. Um, this, but the blacksmith goes and uh, grabs the dagger and pulls it out of the goblin's hilt. And then... Yeah. You see the blacksmith get really angry all of a sudden. And he grabs the dagger and he comes around towards you and he brandishes it at the goblin. And says, What have you done? What, what, where is she? Where is he? What, what's going on? Kind of doing the, you know, Where is she? Uh, Batman thing. And you can see the goblin is just getting freaked out. Like, what on earth have I gotten myself into? They're just going to kill me now. Um, it's just, it's it's starting to just kind of lose reason at this point at, at, at this this situation so what do you do <laughs> I need some brown I'm gonna use some basic brown you get the sense that the goblin kind of figures okay well you know this is what happens to goblins is that as soon as they're found by humans the humans just stab them and take their stuff And he may be right. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna uh, go ahead and paint brown on the this character's backpack while I'm at it. Just because it's like you know I'm right here, I might as well get that painted up. I need to refresh all my paints or a bunch of my paints. They are. Getting low on some of these things. And if what I'm do what, what it's worth, what I'm doing with those dice is I'm basically rolling for the NPCs and the monsters, and they get their own wisdom checks and their own checks like those to see how well they're able to uh, do what they're trying to do. Um, try to reason with the blacksmith looking at the bigger picture of rescuing Diane. Maybe our only clue is to try and be on good terms with him. Okay, so... Blacksmith goes... You're right, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just, as a father, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you understand. I, I just I want to protect my girl. Um, Alright, I will... Uh, and you can see him just starting to, to calm down a little bit, but he's still holding the dagger... Um, you know, not quite at that, uh, at the goblin, but he, he's, he's still kind of holding it in his hand kind of defensively. Perhaps the goblin, uh, well, perhaps, perhaps, that is certainly possible. So yeah, the blacksmith is, has seen reason. What do you do now?
just rolling a reaction for the goblin. Okay. And actually, there are some bits I missed. Always bits you miss. Come on. Get in there. Okay. This is the tough thing about D&D. Or something kind of like D&D like this is that you know it's on you to push the story forward so you've got to you know you, you encounter situations and you gotta fit you gotta figure out what you want to do you gotta, you gotta you know push the story forward by taking some kind of action and it's not always obvious what the right action is sometimes there is no right action sometimes you just gotta you know try something and see what works sometimes you gotta um you know sometimes there are situations for which there is no right answer you can still come out of it great. It's not that you know. It's not that everything's going to go badly. It's just that there is no one obvious right way forward. Okay, oh, and we need a bit more over there. One of the backpack. Good. And all those little little details. Okay. And then yeah, I think I'm going to go ahead and give her. All right, cool. Um, so go ahead and make another wisdom roll, d20 plus one, as you try to, you know, use hand signals and simple words to communicate with the goblin. And what are you, you know, uh, what are you asking the goblin specifically? What are you trying to to do? So kind of narrow it down to one one question that you're trying to ask, with again sort of sign language and and uh, simple words, and then make a, a d20 plus one roll. For your wisdom. Okay. Do -do -do -do. Yakushiki, ah, Yakushiki, you still with us? Still watching? I know this isn't Gundam. That's unfortunate. I actually did write a Gundam-style tabletop RPG once. It was inspired by D&D. Not exactly like D&D, but similar in many ways. All right, 17, good roll. All right, so what what specific question are you asking the goblin? Um, and when you ask the, oh, let's see if maybe, yeah. um, so the blacksmith said there is a woman who lives deep in the woods. There's a hag. Everyone calls her a hag, which is just this woman who lives deep in the woods. And she occasionally comes into to ne the nearby villages and towns to trade for, um, you know, herbs and things like that. She gathers herbs in the woods and then, um, you know, sells them and trades them for, for various things. And she's this old woman. Again, she's kind of unfairly perhaps called a hag. Um, but she might know. Now, she is probably, she's several hours distance west of here. So you have to kind of go back through the, uh, the village in the other direction. And you could talk to her. Um and see what's going on there. Um, that would certainly delay you know, the situation, though. Um, so, I'm not saying you can't, and just to be clear, by the way, some people um, hear these things and they're like, oh, well, then obviously that's not the right, right solution. It might be the right solution, it might be the only way forward, or it might be, it might be the best way forward, but you can't necessarily know. There are lots of different possibilities. Yeah, it's it can be tough. And this guy's got a little uh, like a dagger. 
on one boot that I really like. I'm gonna make sure I paint that brown. A little dagger sheet. has this little brown satchel and make sure that's painted a nice nice brown I might as well do the the belt just do a few little dabs of brown around to give you the sense of the belt and the various edges Yeah, that looks good. Yeah, it's tough. All right. There's a little streak of hair. Hmm. That's the color. She's the wrong color for her hair. Could be that. Come on, pick up the color. There's a little traveler with her. You can't really tell in this lighting very well, but she's got brown boots, brown backpack. Not bad. Okay, so you ask him, you know, why are you alone, basically? Um, um, the goblin then starts to make gestures with his hands and thinks and then actually says the word scout this very heavily accented version of the common tongue in dnd the, the, the standard sort of english is called common you know because it's, it's not going to be literally you know english derived from latin and french um but the common uh, a common things we, he says just the word like scout scout so what do you want to ask him next so obviously he knows some of the common tongue but very very little all right so we've got some nice colors going here um i need to do some armor on these soldiers um one of them I'm using that brown. Um, I think I'm gonna give her a base coat of this brown over here, and I'll use this larger thing. Ah, interesting. So you ask him that, and he he, um, he makes it clear that he is from this group of goblins that captured Diane, um, but he was left here as a scout because they um, you assume because they were afraid that people would come after them and they were right so he does appear to be from those goblins on the other hand um, you have certainly you know Cowed him at this point. Um, he does look, yeah. Um, he does look kind of skittish. You know, he doesn't look like he's going to be particularly uh, loyal to you. It looks like you've intimidated him. You haven't really convinced him of your cause, so to speak. So at this point, it's likely that, you know, if you just said, "Okay, take me to them," um, he might get you some way there, but would eventually just run off. Um, but there are plenty of other options you can do. You could bribe him, you could intimidate him further, um, get information and then let him go. All sorts of options. What do you want to do? You've certainly, you've certainly done a good job of uh, sort of locking him down. So he's he's a good uh, he's a good resource at this point. It's just a question of how exactly you want to re you want to use him.
Welcome, I'm not a tube. Kakushiki, you want to get in on this? You want to, uh, what do you think should be done? You know, we can we can pull you in as another uh, character who's coming down the road and decides to help out. Do you have a particular opinion on uh, what Kuma should do? Ooh. Bunch of uh, stuff to sand off here. And this is not going to work. It's just not thin enough. All right, I better have some sand. Interesting. Okay. I like it. So the blacksmith comes over and he, I mean, he's plenty strong. He has no problem with straining the goblin. Um, the goblin tries to make a break for it, um, but does not succeed. The blacksmith just kind of grabs him and bear hugs him and then ties the rope around. And the goblin kind of gives up at that point. You can tell it's one of those maybe I'll be lucky sort of situations. But the blacksmith... Uh, Definitely make sure that doesn't happen. Why isn't this sanding down? Probably need a, f a coarser grip. Sandpaper, yep. Do -do -do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. So the goblin begrudgingly starts leading you through the forest. Give me another wisdom roll. D20 plus one. 20 tied to die plus one. To see what tracks you're able to make out. Let's see if I can get most of these. Uh, Weird filament. That's better. Yeah. Any remaining lines will just be uh, lines of a cloak. Um, all right, what color we're we using that? Yeah. We got so much of it. Sixteen wisdom. You are hot. Your dice are hot tonight. The RNG loves you. All right. So as you're heading through, you do indeed see that there are tracks of multiple creatures. And uh, you can't really tell um, who's what, but it does look like some are smaller and some are larger. So it could very well be this group. Um, you do notice multiple different sets of tracks here, though, over the course of the last, you know, couple of days. It, it hasn't been just that group moving through here. Other small tracks of humanoids moving through this area, and some of them are sort of across this, this path. And so you're heading through the woods, deep, dark woods. Uh, and you know this is uh, land far from the nearest village. Where sometimes people will, will go deep into here looking for, for some of the stranger and the more rare herbs and such. But far from the world of men. And the environment 
gets almost strangely dark. Now it is getting on towards dusk, but it's not a normal darkness. And soon, the land starts getting a little more hilly. And then the land um, dips down and you see in front of you what looks to be an old stone temple. It's maybe 20 feet wide and 50 feet deep. Kind of like the Parthenon, where it's a bunch of, um, of pillars and then a, a, kind of a roof around it. But then you can also see there's a, a small building within, a small stone building within that. And some of the pillars have broken over time. There's all sorts of moss and things on it. And you see that the ground around the temple has remained clear of some of the, the, the heavier vegetation. So there's maybe 15 feet of essentially low, um, low grasses and such around the temple before, before um, the, you, know, the, the, you get back to the trees and so forth. And you see some of those grasses have been trampled down um, kind of all around the temple. And it looks like you're, you're essentially facing the back of the temple. And it's, it's getting close to dusk at this point. It's a fine summer day. And the goblin just kind of stops and looks at you like, well... And it actually shrugs and says... There. So what do you do? He's not uh, all that thrilled about what's going to happen next. And he's, he's kind of waiting for you to, to, to decide how you want to approach this. But he's definitely not going to take a lot of initiative at this point. Hair untouched, but do the rest of this. And I'll probably do her spear in a different color as well. I might as well give her a nice full coat. Alright. Yeah, I like the idea of giving her a nice brown spear there at some point. That sounds weird and pretty. I'll give her my spear. Mm -hmm. What? All right. So yeah, so there's our little figurine just with a base coat of this, this tan brown. And then where else? I think I'm going to give this guy... Um, we'll, we'll give him pants of that color. Yeah, one of those things where we might as well use this color while we're at it. Well, we got it. It's a nice color. Get in there. Get around here. And wait for backup and give him five gold to appease him. Okay. Five gold is about all the gold you have, by the way. Um, that's a lot of money. Five gold. All right, you can observe the area near the temple. As you do that, suddenly. Mm, uh, an arrow comes flying at you. Um... And uh, kind of out, out of the brush, an arrow comes flying at you. Uh, and so, okay, you give him one gold. Fair enough. Um, and the arrow 
grazes the side of your shoulder and kind of goes in and uh, uh, definitely cuts into the side of your shoulder enough to, I mean, it hurts, it really hurts. Not enough to really stop you or anything, but just like, ow. Um, and that does. Die there. Where are you? All the dice except the one I want. There we go. Ooh, wow. So, um, as a villager, you have a total of 10 hit points. Hit points are your health. Uh, once you get down to zero hit points, you fall unconscious and you begin to die. Um, so out of your 10 hit points, the arrow takes down six of those hit points. You're down. You're now at four hit points total. Um, the arrow may be poisonous. You'll find out later. Um, you have not heard of goblins traditionally poisoning their arrows, but quite a few creatures do, and you know it, it is not unheard of for goblins to poison their arrows. So possible. But not not definite. I'll put it that way. Um, all right. So he's got his. Oh, I'll actually do a little bit more. Put him down behind. So that was a that was a rough roll for you. And you look around and you see there is another goblin um, sort of to your right. <laughs> Uh, uh, to your right, around there. Um, so let me just check something here real quick. Um, yeah. Now the blacksmith is still there. Uh, and the blacksmith's got that dagger. So that's an option. Um, so what do you want to... So actually, tell you what we'll, we'll do. Um, go ahead and just roll um, another d20 and add one. And you're going to do a dexterity roll. To figure out um, uh, who goes first in this series, we're going to enter combat. You're going to roll initiative. Um, there's a d20 roll plus one for your dexterity, and that determines where you are in the order versus the other goblins here who appear to have seen you and are going to uh, and are trying to uh, violently dissuade you from being around. Put it that way. All right, uh, so we're gonna use this color also over here for, um, I think this guy's shirt is gonna have this color. Why not? The sort of jerkin that he's got. Eleven, all right. So the goblins rolled higher. So they're gonna roll again. Ah, they rolled a very low number, uh, total uh, two. And so another arrow goes whizzing past you. So when you're now in combat, so now in combat you get to do two things, um, at, at least two, well, you get basically three things. Um, you get to move, you can move up to 30 feet. It feels like this arrow comes from more than 30 feet away from you, um, uh, you know, to the east. But you, you can certainly head in that direction. Um, yeah, definitely lucky. Um, um, you can attack anything that's, you know, next to you. Or you can trade your attack for an extra movement. So you can move 30 feet and attack... Although it doesn't look like there's anything near 30 feet to attack. Or you can move a total of 60 feet, but then you won't be able to attack because you're sort of running the entire way. You can also, regardless of that other stuff, you can pick something up, call out a command, you know, ask somebody to do something. Um, if you were inside, you could, you know, open a door or um, light a candle or, you know, a, a simple little action like that. So do you want to, what do, what, what do you want to do? I want to move the 30 feet and get as close as possible? Or do you want to you know, get all the way up to this, this enemy? Or, do you, I should also point out, instead of attacking, besides moving, you can also kind of survey the lay of the land. So you can always move, 
you can attack or you can move again or you can um, look at what's going on and try to try to learn more about what's happening in the situation and that will basically be another die roll so maybe a wisdom roll things along those lines what do you want to do let me get his uh, jerkin fully painted the jerkin that's weird. He's got a little bit of plastic on him. I would like to get off. There we go. Hey, there's a little thing that would have just looked looked weird. All right. What's wrong? Rush. Yeah, this is a tough spot. You know, you're a villager. Villagers aren't yet trained in fighting. So you're you're somewhat squishy. Right, so there's that. Um, I think he's going to have a lovely uh, brown cloak. Ooh, I've taken that really well. Wow. I just love that. Okay. My goodness. And of course, you can always run away. You, know, you can always retreat, tactically disengage, and the further you are from your enemy when you do that, you know, the less likely they are to, uh, to be able to harass you as you leave. So that's always an option as well. You know, discretion being the better part, part of Valor and all that. All right, so we're just getting this brown on this guy's cloak. Classic just sucked this paint right onto it. Like it was it's always been that color. That's great. Cool. I'm gonna survey move as much as I can and resurvey the land where the attacking goblin is, and whilst the black to keep the goblin who's not. Okay, cool. So the let's check on the Oh okay, wow. The blacksmith rolled a 20 on his initiative. Um all right, so the blacksmith um, should have rolled for him earlier, actually. Um, he passes you the dagger. And uh, so you go ahead uh, and give me another wisdom check to see what you're able to see in this environment. That's a smart thing for you to do. Might not work out, but it's a smart thing to do. Like I said, in D&D, &D, there are usually no tried and true, or there, there are not always tried and true, the best solution to any problem. It is a solution you come up with. All right, so here's the guy, and here's his cloak. Have a nice. All righty, so now what we're going to do... Um, is I'm gonna rinse off these brushes. I'm gonna put some armor. On the, oh, he needs he needs. Yeah. Um, we're gonna use that. Yeah. Okay. I like this color for his pants. Yeah, that's good. You know, I don't want the idea that he's running around naked, <laughs> but I want his uh, his clothes to be. All right, 11. So with that, you're able to see about 45 feet away from you, again, to your right, um, uh, to the right of the temple, is another goblin hiding um, actually partway up a tree. He's in sort of the branch of a tree. And he's got his, his bow. And he's getting ready to fire at you again. 
Um, and so you get about 15 feet away from him, and he is continuing to draw that bead on you. Uh, as you get closer to him, you're now near the side of the temple, and you see that the temple is quite old. It's definitely, you know, at least 100 years old, and it certainly hasn't been used in decades. And it's crumbling to a great extent. Um, and now that you're looking at the grass, it looks like the other side of the temple is the entrance. Because you see things are sort of more matted down back there. And that's how much you see. So now it's the blacksmith's turn, because he rolled nice and high. So what do you want the blacksmith to do? I'll, I'll let you decide what the blacksmith does, and then I'll roll his dice to see how well he does. But what do you think the blacksmith should do? He's giving you the dagger. Um, the blacksmith can always use an improvised weapon, so he can like throw stones or you know, punch or whatever. So you know, he, al he can always do something, and he, he can also survey things as well and yell them out to you. So he has the same basic move set that you do. Should have given him bare feet, but no. Okay. Let's get his feet cleaned up. Might go for a different. You know what? Yeah, I'm gonna give him brown feet. Give him basically leather boots other shoes of some kind just for the added interest just to make it different some kind of fight club about this character so this is another area in this uh, this adventure the players can come across this this area that represents the wilderness and there's a character in there that just uh, um, is constantly fighting he has all these arenas set up and he has the monsters in there fight each other in these big battles uh, and he is the most powerful fighter in there so when the players show up player characters show up they uh, he immediately challenges them to a duel and it's a tough fight and if they win then they get the uh, the, the magical MacGuffin thing in that that area so it's just kind of a straight up you know fight nothing too too weird there, but it just adds an, another, again, just kind of another uh, interesting flavor bit because you have all these monsters around, um, and you can kind of get into the ethics of what he's doing. Okay, interesting. This is barely like it's the same color. <laughs> okay, so there's that. Um. Oh, okay, nice. So the blacksmith makes a wisdom roll. Ooh, a 17. Nice. All right. So the blacksmith manages to convey this to the goblin. Now the goblin has his own roll. Okay. Um, so the goblin decides, the, the, the goblin uh, yells out something in this very guttural language. Um, and what happens then is that the goblin, um, actually, what did you roll for your, okay, yeah, you, you rolled there. So, um, the goblin that was in the tree leaps out of the tree and runs towards the temple. And he gets about 15 feet away. So he's now about 30 feet from you. He had to, he had to hop down and then, then head off. Actually, um, yeah. <laughs> it sounds kind of Mandarin-ish. Um, so what do you do now? So uh, you know, the, 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 the goblin isn't obviously 
retreating or stopping. I mean, it's retreating from this situation, but it's not like it dropped its weapons and surrendered. So what do you want to do? And we're, we're still kind of in combat in the sense of, of turns. So you can move, you know, attack or move or survey. What do you want to do? And meanwhile, let me rinse this off so I can do some armor here. I like the idea that goblins speak Mandarin. That's, that's kind of cool. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do now... Uh, we're not going to finish painting all of these guys tonight. But what I am going to do is I'm going to paint armor on these two armored guys and paint um, you know, metallic on this guy's axe. So at least finish them out. Uh, out. Uh, and then maybe next week we'll, we'll finish painting the rest of these little guys. And I'll have some other stuff. See ya, Yaku. Thank you. All right, so let's first off. We'll close the second goblin while keeping his distance to the gauge if he's going to attack or not. All right, so you run up to the other goblin. Uh, you're essentially keeping pace with the goblin. Um, and it continues running in towards the entrance to the temple, which is about 50 feet away from you. And you can see he's sort of picking up speed. And he's going to just sort of dash into that temple. Um, so now it's the, so what, the, what does the blacksmith do in response to this? While I pull out my metallic colors here. And I'm going to give, I think this guy's going to get the steel as well. Just cap off some of these paints so they don't completely dry out. Uh, and I'm going to remind myself to uh, uh, check my paints and get some extras. Alright, so yeah, so we want this steel on um, the red guy. Red tends to um, come through colors. It's very hard to paint over. So I wanted a dark, thick metal here for him. And that's definitely dark and thick. So we'll see how how this ends up looking. I think it'll look pretty good. And, and it's gonna be more or less just metal everywhere on him. You can see that this, uh, this filament I used for this was not the best because it's just it's very, uh, very knobbly. We live and learn. And obviously just for for minis that you're throwing a, a table in front of friends doesn't have to be ideal. Okay. Interesting how the red kind of for the details adds an extra almost a this shininess to it, glowing with, uh, with power. This armor of mine glows with an awesome power. It is telling me to defeat you. Um, blacksmith survey the area, make sure there aren't any traps, additional goblins that do picture attacks. It's getting dark. It is indeed getting dark. Uh, all right. So wow, the blacksmith rolls an 18 on his 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 check. So he yells out to you. There's something, some creatures roosting in the roof of the temple. And that's all he's able to kind of get out in his quick check.
check, but he, he's looking over the temple and he sees this. There's something in there. Something, something there. Ooh, and, and yeah. Um, so his sort of crotch flap should not be made of metal. So we'll, we'll put some, some brown on that. Um, so that's what the blacksmith does. Um, he doesn't say anything about any other goblins. That's the, the, he doesn't seem to see any other goblins. But he definitely sees creatures roosting. In the temple. The temple, uh, uh, temple roof. So now it is your turn. The, actually no, it is the goblin's turn, excuse me. So the goblin books it into the temple's entrance. It just runs right past into it. So as you come around, you see that indeed the front of the temple has this, uh, some old carving on the face of it and then uh, th these these two big doors two big wooden doors that have been pulled out been pulled open uh, one of them is is slightly off its hinges and they're leaning there big doors 10 foot tall doors heavy heavy doors and so they are um, yeah, th th uh, they're open and he's just booked it right inside there um, and like I said there's there's some kind of carvings on either side of the, the temple but it's you know you, you can't immediately tell they're, they're weathered you can't immediately tell what those carvings are you could stop to look but that would kind of take up an action so it's now your turn the goblin has run through and disappeared into the opening into the entrance to this temple it's an abandoned temple what do you do Nice metal. Oh yeah, I, 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 that shouldn't be metal. Okay, um, that's okay. I can always paint over it. Boy, yeah, it's not really. This is probably the most knobbly mini I've ever printed. Actually, that's not true. I, I've had some really funky prints before. Feels that way. Okay. Get in there. Go down there. And then, yeah, the arms. Arms. With the entry way and allow the blacksmith on our hostage to reach where I'm standing. All right. So. Hmm. Uh, the, the blacksmith and the goblin come up. You see the, the goblin's struggling now, struggling to get away. Uh, but the blacksmith is. Uh, he's actually pulled the ropes even tighter on the goblin. And they're coming up. Um, and as they come up. The, uh, um, uh, yeah, you, you, uh, you're standing there. You do hear the footsteps of the goblin retreating down within the temple. So you're just going like down into the earth within there. It's, it's dark enough now that you cannot see inside those doors unless you like went right up, right up to it. Uh, and with the overhang of the, the roof, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Okay, um, so the goblin, um, when you say this, the goblin just shakes its head. It, 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 it is refusing to go inside. What do you do? I did get his head. Didn't get off his head. That is a helmet that should be... Covering. How long before backup arrives? I'm not going to destroy the worst case scenario. Um, there may not be any backup. 
I mean, it may just be you and the blacksmith. Nobody else came with you. And there's been uh, no way to ask for backup. Get one more gold coin. Um, you offer the gold coin and he doesn't take it. It's not worth his life. And as you look at him with your wisdom, you realize, like if he goes in there, he's gonna be a pin cushion. Like they're gonna have, they're probably not gonna have much, they're probably not gonna worry about not hitting him, you know? Now that he's turned coat, um, they're not probably not gonna take any chances. I mean, they're not gonna try to kill him necessarily, but you get this sense that he's like, eh, that is not gonna be good for my long-term health going in there. All right, and then we will give him. I'll just use that brown again, and it's right there. And we will paint in his. Oh no! Dang it! We already used the, that brown for his. Uh, his <laughs> his skin tone. That's that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Use that nice dark brown for his. Yeah. He's got this. Belt. I want to make sure that's a nice dark brown. That's better. That's much better. That's much more logical. Okay. Spaces. And then more of the metal. Uh, where was it? It was somewhere where I was missing metal. Where was it? Uh, I don't see a place where I was missing metal. I can use them there. It's okay. Um, yeah, let's move that right, okay, uh, and then we're going to do this guy in, does he need to be the steel? No, I don't think he needs to be the steel, he needs a better coat. Um, let the goblin go in good faith, thank you for giving a gold coin, Is kind gesture of asking one last question, who's leader and how many hostages are there? Excellent question. So, um, he says... So he says, we led by Azarag, high shaman, make us strong. If sacrifice girl becomes stronger, Azarag new ruler, new leader. But now I go to find new destiny. And Gabi 
takes off into the wilderness. Just like I, done. I am done. I am out of here. This you know, this will not end well for me or anyone probably. So he is he's gone. Actually, just realized there's yep. I can go ahead and paint his his crotch flaps right now, and then do the armor around it. Although I might want to do the armor first as well. So go ahead and do this, and then we can always touch up the armor. Okay. Okay, now, as you learn this, and as you head inside, suddenly these creatures, you hear the, the fluttering of bat-like wings, and these creatures descend on you from the roof above, from the shadows of the roof above, invisible in the dusk. They drop out. They are these dark red creatures. They're kind of like giant bats, but they have these strange snouts, these strange pincher-like snouts that come at you, and they, they, they come down, and they they start attacking that uh, you. And uh, go ahead and roll. Give me another wisdom roll. Uh, I'm sorry, dexterity roll. And I'll roll for them. They did not roll well. And to roll for yourself and roll for the blacksmith. As you walk inside. And these things descend on you. That's true. Chance of communication given, given Gabi. There's his crotch flap, and now we move on to the armor. I'm going to go with a more burnished, um, a lighter color for this guy's armor. I did another guy where I really changed up the metal a lot, and I kind of like that. Where different parts of the, the, uh, the figure had different tonal qualities of the metal. That made sense for your sort of town guard. But I'm not going to do that every single time. Another thing about minis is that if you make everything look kit bashed, you know, every, you know, realistically, different people will have different combinations of, of armor and, and stuff. Okay, nice. So the blacksmith will go first. Then you, then these creatures. Um, you'll add, um, what was your dexterity? Your dexterity. Your dexterity was high, right? Um, cool. Um, so yeah, you'll, you'll add a, uh, so you, Kuma, will add a three. The blacksmith adds zero. He does not have an, uh, any dexterity bonus. Um, but I think in this case, those numbers will remain the same. It's a, you, know, you, you all ended up in the same range, and that, that plus three will still put you in the same spot. So that's a good, good question. You carry the world upon your but Blacksmith goes first. The next 17. Okay, yeah, so you would add, add a three to your initiative rolls in general. But with the, yeah, so in other words, you, you, you end up with a blacksmith has a, has a uh, 19, you have a total of, seven, of 10, excuse me, 7 plus 3. So, same effect this time. Alright, just get the rest of this metal on. So, what does the blacksmith do? As he's just trying to get his daughter back. So, you're kind of in the entrance, you're, you're starting to, to enter this room, I assume. So he can either fully enter the chamber or engage with the uh, 
creatures on the outside. Yeah, they're probably going to follow you inside, so you can you can choose where you guys decide to engage, one place or the other. Yeah, so if you if you make everyone piecemeal, so everyone has their own different combination of armor, then everything's piecemeal and it's a little it's, it's still harder to find to, to differentiate between different characters because everyone's got their own different uh, you know uh, combination of things. Whereas if you have some sense of uh, color scheme, uh, then it's just a little easier to differentiate. It's not quite as realistic, but this is a tabletop game where you want to be able to say. I attack that one, you know, that one there, and if that one with the lighter armor, it's easier. Well, that's a, a thing I've discovered just kind of from a gameplay perspective. Alright, do the rest of this. He should probably have leather boots, which I might add, instead of, you know, Probably does not have metal boots. Those existed, but it's pretty, pretty unusual for your average character. But maybe not for him. Who knows? He might be a crazy martial guy. I think the uh, the intent for this guy was for him to be like a, a town guard. But these are pretty darn impressive town guards. How's the lighting? Um, are the torches outside, or is it still some semblance of light from the sun? Excellent question. There is um, there is some semblance of light from the sun. It is dusk at this point. You know, we're we're at at dusk, so still enough lighting to like if you if you go inside, your eyes will adjust and you'll be able to see what's in there roughly with the light coming in the open doorway. Um, but anything further than that, no. You do see through the doorway uh, and looking down. It looks like there's some passage heading down into the earth and you see the glimmer of some kind of light down there. Very far away, very faint. But it looks like there is some lighting down there. And you guys act before the monsters. Uh, you guys did not bring... Actually, no, I'll, I'll change that. You guys have... You guys brought with you uh, two torches. Each torch will last for an hour. And you can light them without a problem. Like, you guys know how to light them. So you guys have two torches. That's standard adventuring equipment. So do you want to spend an, a, uh, a turn lighting those torches? The blacksmith could, could light one and then you do something. So you don't have to, you don't have to each carry a torch. Just be one of you. I'm feeling like, yeah, I think I'm going to give him a different colored helmet. I am going to differentiate that much. Oops. A bit more on this side. I didn't quite get. A bit more in there, actually. And then it. Whoop. Nip, nip. Nip, 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 nip. Nip, 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 nip. Good, 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 good. Yeah, we know. Let's see what's with that. Back to take the sword. Okay, cool. Uh, so we got the, 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 the so we'll do this this sterling color. For that. Yeah. So this is kind of a medium metallic for his helmet. That'll just make it a little different. It stand out. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> looks very similar, actually. I mean, you look very closely and it's different, which is actually good. That's what I'm going for. I'm not trying to make it massively different. Just get that sense of, oh, man, maybe his helmet comes from a different set. Maybe he's not super wealthy. And so he just he gets whatever armor he can find. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So these 
guys fly down. The first one rolls a natural 20. Right. Okay. We'll deal with that in a second. When you come back, we will we will go with we will resolve this round, and then that'll probably be it for us for tonight. Because we've been we've been going for like three hours now. Oh, I forgot my key. My key is cold. Dope. Alright, let me go ahead and I will give him his nice brown uh, axe handle. Gonna be some delicate work here with his axe handle. Without also getting it all over his skin. It's got to be middle of the night for you there, Kuma. I don't know how you stay up this late. Feels really delicate. Got a bit more back here. Just trying to cover every surface. All right. Cool. So here's our barbarian with his axe, and now we just got to get the uh, the handle painted. And so I'm gonna go and grab. Um, I'm gonna use the sterling. Let's try the sterling. See what that looks like. Sterling silver. Mm, nah, steel. Nice dark steel. I think. Yeah, no, I think it's gonna be. Yeah, we'll, we'll do this story. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. That's. That's good. That's just the color I'm looking for. I'll probably benefit from one more coat. It's a little light, my first coat. But yeah. There we go. Do we have any bad guys? He's got a bunch of armor on, but I don't feel like he's got some armor too. Um, I'll just go ahead and add some armor to him. Because, uh, he, yeah, he's definitely got armored uh, pant things here. I, mean, I know they're called something, but I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Got a mace as well. I might go ahead and shiny up that mace. Metal there. Okay. Cool. He is now. He now has metal pants. That's good. Uh, and I think I will. Do the same on his epaulets and his shoulder. Shoulder, I'll, I'll, I'll paint him in that, that metal color. And I'll figure out his cloak color some other time. Maybe a nice royal purple or something. It feels like a villain of some kind. I mean, 
spiked shoulder pads kind of scream villain to me. I don't know about you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. No problems. So the creatures flew down at you. As you guys are standing in, the, so you, you headed in, head, you headed into the temple. You, there are these staircase. There's, there's these stairs going down. You stop there to defend yourself. A the first monster came down. The first the bat-like thing came down. Flew the, the the blacksmith and rolled a natural twenty on the die. And a natural twenty means uh, wow, that's, that's, that's not showing up the right uh, thing. Anyway. A natural 20 means an automatic hit and double damage. That's bad for the blacksmith. So we'll see what happens. Four. Four. Wow. The blacksmith takes eight points of damage out of his ten. Um, so he's down now to two hit points. The other bat thing comes flying at you. Wow. It rolls a, a 19 against your armor class, so it's going to do some damage. Actually, no, these guys don't use that die. One second, I just realized they use different dice. I apologize. It's not going to be that much damage. It's going to be less damage than that, hopefully. Two. Two, yeah. Okay, sorry. Four points of damage on the blacksmith. So the blacksmith's at six. My mistake. Um, the other bat comes down, and oh, wow. Yeah. So the other the other bat comes down and it does four points of damage to you. <laughs> so you're knocked unconscious, but the blacksmith is still there. Now, the blacksmith is still conscious. You're there. Um, what would you like the blacksmith to do? He can certainly drag you out of the way and try to revive you, right? He's going to ditch you and go inside the temple. Wow, okay, cool. All right, so the blacksmith runs down the stairs into the temple. And we're going to have to stop there for now because it's almost midnight my time. It must be like 5 a.m. your time, Puma. And we'll have to continue this next week. Because it is very late here. And there's plenty more to, to, to go inside that temple. So that was D&D. That is what D&D is basically like. A few more stats than that. A few more rolls. A few more rules and attributes and such. But that's basically D&D. What'd you think, Kuma? And I'm serious. We'll continue that next week. We'll we'll continue uh, the uh, the adventure next week. We might have uh, uh, more folks in the chat room to uh, uh, to form a, a larger adventuring party. Cool. I'm glad you liked it. It's a lot of fun, isn't it? All right. So as a quick summary, here's our painted giants and it's kind of as a, a thing so you compare all, all three so you have different uh, flesh tones on each one so you can kind of uh, differentiate them that's nice and then we have our uh, barbarian who's just sort of flesh colored with pants and his and now the camera wants to uh, appreciate that we have our little guards um, who are basically just three colors. So that gives us something there. Uh, hey. Kind of. And then we put some flesh tones in some of the other colors, and, uh, some other characters, and just kind of got a, a decent start on a bunch of those. We can go back and do some more, uh, more. Yeah, maybe someone can rescue you. What we might do next time 
is uh, you can play a different character who comes in. Um, maybe you're the backup. Your character can be the backup that comes running from the village to help a blacksmith. That, that might totally work. And you can be a different kind of character next time. You could be somebody more sneaky, somebody more, you know, you, you might have learned a spell or two. Who knows? All right, so that will do it for us for tonight. Thank you all, as always, for joining me. Thank you, Kuma. And um, um, as I mentioned, I'll be at a con this weekend. I do plan to, to go live Friday night, but it's always a little weird at conventions, uh, scheduling and, and uh, con um, internet. I'm going to try to do a review of um, Baby My Princess Me You, but with, with con internet, that might not be a great idea. Um, I might be, I, you know, it might be a really choppy video. Um, so we'll see. You're very welcome, Kuma. That was a lot of fun. You did very well. Um, you know, the, the dice rolled very much for you, and then they kind of rolled against you a little bit in the uh, in that first encounter. And that's just what, kind of what happened. So we just, you know, we'll, we'll continue from there. Thank you, and uh, we will see you later on.